thesis is, is a picture really worth a thousand words? Juror verdict decisions based on the modality of recorded confession. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to uh, scan this QR code for the handout. So the purpose of my study uh, was to understand the effect each modality of recorded confession has on deception detection. Um, and so you'll hear me say this throughout. The three modalities that I focus on is audio-visual, audio-only, and transcript recorded confessions. And I basically wanted to know if it was possible for a jury to spot a false confession using a certain modality of recorded confession. Uh, so there's a big, expansive literature on lie detection and false confessions. Basically, we on average are no better than chance at detecting a lie. Um, however, there's a dearth of research on how different modalities of recorded confessions could help jurors discern a truthful confession compared to a false confession. And there's also a scarcity of empirically based guidelines and policies regarding how recordings should be used in the courtroom and how to assess authenticity of confessions. So there are three different types of false confession. There's a voluntary false confession, which happens when a person falsely confesses to a crime that they did not commit without prompting from law enforcement. There's a compliant false confession, which happens when a person who falsely confesses to a crime they did not commit with prompting from law enforcement, which basically they're complying with the demands for a confession. And then there's an internalized false confession, which basically means that the individual actually starts to believe that they committed the crime. So the biggest piece of information I can leave you with, and most of you have heard me say this at least once, is that everyone can falsely confess. With that said, there are certain people who are more prone to falsely confessing, such as juveniles and people with intellectual disabilities, such as a low IQ. Um, also, people who are in a longer interrogation, they have an increased likelihood to falsely confess. So in the past decade, public awareness has grown on this issue. Um, to date, there's about 375 people who have been exonerated due to DNA, and of those cases, about 29% involved a false confession. Breaking that down a little bit more, about 49% of those false confessors were 21 years and younger. About 31% of those false confessors were 18 years old or younger. And then 9% of those false confessions had mental health or mental capacity issues known at trial. Um, some of the pictures up here that you can see, we have George Steine up top. George Steine Jr., he's a 14-year-old boy that falsely confessed to raping a woman during the Jim Crow South. Um, he was electrocuted. Um, this is the Central Park Five. Oldest one was 16 years old. Two were 14, two were 15 years old. Uh, they all falsely confessed to raping a woman in the park. And then, of course, this is the poster for Making Murder on Netflix. Netflix has been pretty big at producing documentaries on false confessions. They're also going to be doing one on the Central Park Five. Um, and then, interesting thing about this is Brendan Daisy, who's talked about in Making a Murderer, his false confession was one of the false confessions I used for my experience. So before my previous study and this study, there wasn't a lot of research on the different modalities. The one study that there was was in 2013, which was conducted by Bradford, Goodman, Delonte, and Brooks. And they basically found that people tend to more accurately pick up on false confessions when presented with audio-only recordings rather than the auto-visual recordings, which is typically what you would be shown in a trial. They also found that individuals who matched audio-visual recordings were more suspicious of the true confessors than the false confessors. And so basically, it really showed that there were a lot of impaired judgments and decreased accuracy in deception detection. So my previous study was a two by three factorial design between subjects, non repeated measures. My independent variables were gender of the participant, just male and female, and then the modality of the confession. So audio visual, audio only, and transcript. Then my dependent variables were perception of defendant's behavior, deception detection, and then verdict. Uh, with the perception of defendant's behavior, I got that from a questionnaire. It was a 10 question questionnaire that I gave them. Uh, low, the scores could range from 10 from the lowest to 60 from the highest. And low scores meant that the defendant was perceived to be exhibiting more truthful type behaviors. And then the higher score means that the defendant was perceived to be exhibiting more deceitful type behaviors. So as you can see, I didn't have a lot of participants. I only had about 38 participants, 20 which were female, 18 which were male. And I conducted this at a small university in Northwest Ohio. So basically my materials in this QR code leads to the old previous materials. Um, I had 38 consent forms and graph surveys and folders, 12 case files, 12 questionnaires, and then 12 total recorded confessions. So I had four audio-visual, 
for audio only and then for transcript confessions. So the procedure for this, my previous study, is very similar to my current study with like slight differences. So participants were given informed consent and asked to fill out the demographic surveys before the study began. Once the study began and before a confession was administered, participants were read facts pertaining to the case. And these facts dealt with the ages of the victim, the ages of the defendant, um, how the victim was killed, if there were eyewitness testimony. I basically kept these facts to be five or seven facts per case for each confession, and I would read that to them before they would fill out their questionnaire. So then from there, I would administer the confession, do that 12 different times, and then I'd give them their questionnaire, they'd fill it out, it had agree and disagree statements. Um, so for example, one of the statements was, the defendant appears nervous, and you could agree to that or disagree, and it went all the way up from slightly to strongly. And then they were given a verdict. So they were told, give a verdict, either guilty or not guilty, for this defendant. So I know this looks a little scary, but it's just the mean scores on perception of defendant behavior. So orange is audio visual, green is audio only, and purple is transcript. All right, I had 12 total confessions, so there's 12 bars here. The darker colors of each, the dark orange, the dark green, and the dark purple are my false confessors. I only had three false confessions, and they were all males. So from what you can see here, I didn't find any statistically significant findings when compared to verdict and compared to gender of participant when it came to the mean scores. Um, and you can see they're all in similar ranges. Um, it's very interesting, this kind of shows what the 2013 study showed, is true confessors, so the lighter colors, rated higher on the perception score, slightly higher, which means they were exhibiting more deceitful type behaviors, whereas the false confessors who were falsely confessing were seen as exhibiting more truthful type behaviors. Uh, so again, similar setup. We have audio, visual, audio only, and purple, which is transcript. These are the not guilty verdicts for each. And I want you to specifically just look at the false confessions. So we had audio, visual, false confessor that had 34% of participants give a not guilty um, verdict. And then coming in second was the audio only false confessor with 39% saying they were not guilty. And then who did? The best, and I use that generously, was the transcript confession with 45% of participants giving a not guilty verdict. Um, important to notice here, this is still worse than chance when it comes to detecting the correct confession. So again, this is the same graph, but now you're seeing the female participants. You have the audiovisual, now only 25% of females gave a not guilty for the audiovisual false confessor, whereas 55% of females gave a not guilty verdict for the audio only. So slightly better than chance, but not great. And then 45% gave a not guilty for the transcript. Now when it comes to the audio visual and the audio only, pay attention to those because it kind of flips for the males. So now that we get to the males, about 44% gave a not guilty verdict for the audio visual confessor, false confessor, and then 28% gave not guilty for the audio only. And then both men and women were pretty equal when it came to the transcript. 45 and 44%. Um, this is for my false confessor for audiovisual. It was found to be statistically significant with gender at a p value of 0 0.05. Uh, the green is basically male and female, all participants together. But when you come to the male and the female, this is where the 44% of males gave a not guilty verdict, but only 25% of females gave a not guilty verdict. And now we go to this one which was my audio only, where 55% of females gave a not guilty and only 28% of males gave a not guilty. But this was not found to be statistically significant, which is a bit counterintuitive. So now on to my current study. I basically wanted to continue where I left off with some slight differences. There were some major issues with the previous study, one being that I didn't have a lot of participants at all. I had only 38, and I needed 180. So I definitely wanted to get more. Um, and then there was no qualitative information. So I didn't have reasonings for verdicts, so I, I couldn't really tell you why 55% of females gave a not guilty verdict for the audio only, because I just, I didn't ask. And then the length of experiment. It took over an hour to collect data, and so I, it, they were fatigued, I was fatigued, it was just a really long, I needed to shorten that. So my empirical questions were, what is the relationship between audio visual, audio only, and transcript confessions and deception detection? 
What is the relationship between the defendant's gender and verdict? And what is the relationship between the participant's gender and verdicts? So from a hypothesis about what is the relationship between audiovisual, audio-only, transcript confessions, and deception detection, I said subjects will more easily detect deception in audio-only confessions, and then subjects will struggle to detect deception most with audio-visual confessions. And basically how I, I figured this one out was with the verdict decisions. If they scored one, two, and three, and I'll talk about the verdict scale later on a little bit. Um, if they scored one, two, or three, that basically was a not guilty verdict. And so if they got that correct for the false confession, then I counted that as them figuring out the deception there. If they scored four, five, or six, which meant guilty, then they got it wrong. So for my second question, what is the relationship between the defendant's gender and verdict? I said that male defendants would be rated higher on the verdict scale than female defendants. And then for my hypothesis, third hypothesis, for the question, what is the relationship between the participants' gender and verdicts, I said male subjects will rate confessions higher on the verdict scale than female subjects. So my design was a two by two by three factorial design between subjects and our repeated measure. My independent variables were gender of the defendant, so male and female defendants, the gender of subjects, so you got male and female subjects, and then the modality, which again is audio visual, audio only, and then transcript. And then my de dependent variable was the verdict. So again, procedure was very similar to the last procedure. Um, subjects were gathered from Click Worker in multiple locations in the state of Ohio, because this was the difference here was this was an online survey. Uh, subjects were given a link to a Google survey which had their informed consent, it had the demographic survey, and then it actually had my experiment survey. Uh, before each confession was administered, subjects were given a list of facts about the case. Instead of me reading these facts out to them, I had typed it up and they could read it themselves and have those facts for themselves. And then subjects were asked to watch, listen to, and read a combination of 12 recorded confessions from real defendants. After the confession had been administered, the subjects filled out the verdict scale and briefly explained why they chose the verdict that they did. And then subjects were thanked for their participation, participation and debrief. And for these 12 confessions, they were publicly available confessions and most of them were obtained through YouTube. So for the materials, I had much better luck at getting participants. Um, I ended up getting 219, but had to remove 17. Um, so I ended up with 202 participants, 144 which were female, 58 which were male. Um, so basically I had 204 consent documents, demographic surveys, and Google surveys. Uh, I had the 12 verdict scales with the qualitative question, I'll get to that the next slide I believe. Uh, 12 case files and then 12 confessions. So here's the verdict scale that I used. Um, at the lower end, the one, two, and three, basically it states that the evidence favored the defendant in some form, either strongly, moderately, or slightly, i.e. not guilty. And then on the four, five, and six part of the scale, this stated that the evidence favored the prosecution in some form, either strongly, moderately, or slightly, and, i.e. guilty. Uh, the defendant equals the person who may be charged of the crime, and the prosecution is the one who brings the case slash the charges. My qualitative question was briefly explain why you gave the verdict you did, and this was after the verdict scale. Uh, I used SPSS and Excel for data analysis. The tests that I used were the dependent and independent t-tests, one-way ANOVA, Pearson correlation, and a very basic theme analysis. So first I'm going to talk about the verdict decisions for false confessions. So here, this is the audiovisual male defendant two, which was my false confession for audiovisual, you can see here that a majority of participants gave a guilty verdict, or basically stated that the evidence favored the prosecution in some form, whereas about 28% of participants stated the evidence favored the defendant in some form, i.e. not guilty. Here for my audio-only male false confessor, you can see again, the vast majority gave a guilty verdict, he was guilty in some form, whereas 29%, almost 30% of participants stated that the evidence favored the defendant in some form, i.e. not guilty. And here the difference between the previous study and this study is that gap between um, audio-visual and audio-only, it closed. It's only about a 1.4% difference between audio-visual and audio-only now. And then transcript, of course, again, I'll use this generously, did best here with only 61% giving a guilty verdict, whereas 38% gave a not guilty verdict. 
but still worse than the last, the previous study where it was at 44%. So now I'm gonna be talking about my gender participant versus the verdict score. So for this one, out of the 12 tests that I ran, uh, three were found to be statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.05. This one was the audiovisual male defendant two, which was my false confession. This was significant as a p-value of 0 0.031. And you can see here that female participants were a little bit harsher, meaning that their mean score was a little bit higher um, on the scale compared to males. But here, I know the gap looks very big, but it's actually 0.1 difference. And if you rounded it up, it'd pretty much be the same. Um, but this was found statistically significant, and the females rated higher. Here we have my audio-only female defendant, and of course, all female defendants were true confessions. This was significant at the 0 0.05. Here again, females are a little bit harsher with a mean score of 5.3, whereas males have a mean score of 4.9. And this is my transcript male defendant one, which is a true confession and had a p-value of 0 0.044. And here you can see females had a higher mean score of 5.1 or 5.2 if you round up, and then males had a mean score of 4.9. Here is the gender of the defendant versus verdict score. For these ones, I used a dependent t-test, and about six tests were found statistically significant out of the 12 that I ran. So over here I have my audiovisual male defendant one paired with my audiovisual female defendant one. This was found significant at a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Here you can see that the male defendant was rated higher with a mean score of 4.8, whereas the female defendant was rated lower with a mean score of 4.1. Here's my audiovisual male defendant two paired with my audiovisual female defendant one. This was significant at a p-value of 0 0.011. Here you can see that again, the male defendant was rated higher with a mean score of 4.5, whereas the female defendant was rated lower with a mean score of 4.1. Now moving on to my audio only. Here's my audio only male defendant one paired with my audio only female defendant one. This was found significant of a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Here it's kind of the reverse where the female defendant is now rated higher with a mean score of 5.2 and then the male defendant is rated lower with a mean score of 4.4. Here we have the audio male defendant one paired with the audio only female defendant two. This was significant at a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Again, female rated higher with a mean score of 5.2 and the male was rated lower with a mean score of 4.4. Here's my transcript male defendant two paired with the transcript female defendant two, found significant again at less than 0 0.001. Here we have the female defendant two rated higher again with a mean score of 5.2, and then the male defendant rated with a mean score of 4.1 if you round up. Here we have the transcript male defendant two paired with transcript female defendant one. Again, found significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Female defendant again for here was rated higher with a mean score of 4.9 or five if you round up, and then the male defendant rated lower with a mean score of 4.1 if you round up. Um, my study really focused on gender, especially with the gender of the defendant and gender of the participant, and that's what I was really looking at. But my demographic survey, I collected a lot more data, like marital status, political leanings, age, stuff like that. And so I had the data and I thought it would be fun to kind of run it just to see what I had. And so I did. They have to it fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> So first thing was age and verdict score. I did a piercing correlation for this. Um, five, five tests that I ran out of the 12 were found statistically significant. I have these two as an example here. Um, what I noticed with these was people who were 60 years old or older tend to do rate harsher on the verdict scale. So meaning they had a four or they had a five or six. And so um, basically you can see here, six year olds and up, they're over here on the harsher side, the guilty side, the fourth, five, and six, and same here where they only had fours and fives. That's what I noticed. So with political leaning, there was only one test found to be statistically significant at a p-value of 0 0.003. Um, and from here you can see, and this was my transcript female defendant one, which, true confession, you can see in this one test that conservatives rated higher with a um, mean score of 5.1 if you round up, with liberals scoring lower with a mean score of 4.9 if you round up. 
Um, when it comes to political leanings, only one test was found statistically significant. And even if you look at the non-statistically significant tests, there are instances where liberals rated higher than conservatives and conservatives rated and vice versa. And they're very, very close to each other. And so there really wasn't a difference when it came to political leanings and verdict decisions. Here is marital status. Again, only one test was found to be statistically significant at a p-value of 0.038. Um, here you have the married scoring a little bit higher with an average mean score of 5.1, and then the unmarried coming in with a mean score of 4.9. Uh, again, similar to the political leanings test, only one was found statistically significant. If you look at all of the tests combined, you know, you have some were unmarried rated higher than married, and married rated higher than unmarried. Um, and again, so there wasn't really much difference when it came to marital status and how the decisions were made. Here is employment. I had two tests that were found to be statistically significant, one at a p-value of 0 0.014 and one at a p-value of 0 0.043. This was my audio-only male defendant, a true confession, and transcript female defendant one, which is also a true confession. Here you can see that the unemployed rated higher both times, um, one with a mean score of 5.2 and the other one with a mean score of 5.6. Um, again, similarly to marital and political leanings, um, there was only two that were found statistically significant. And again, there are instances where full-time would be harsher or part-time would be harsher than the other two. And so there didn't really seem to be a big difference when it came to employment. Now here is the theme analysis. So this is for my audiovisual false confession, and I really focused on just the false confessions when it came to the theme analysis. Uh, the colors that I really want you to pay attention to are orange, yellow, and green, and then two more colors that will pop up later on is pink and purple. Um, for anyone that does end up having questions about the gray one, that's kind of like the miscellaneous where it was more like they're giving opinions about uh, crime, violence, and the criminal justice system, system at large instead of giving a reason for why they gave a verdict. Anything that was like that got put into that category. And so there were a lot of comments where people had just had opinions about like, oh, stop violence or stop hate or crime is wrong, stuff like that that got put into the miscellaneous category. It really wasn't helpful when it came to the false confession. Um, so the Orange category is for guilty. So basically this is any comments that had, well he admitted it so he's guilty or they just blankly said he was guilty. Um, also anybody that said the evidence favored the prosecution in some form, that got put in the orange. For yellow, that's false confession territory. So anything that where they blankly said, I think this is the false confession or the evidence favored the defendant or they stated something about um, investigators uh, leading, asking leading questions, or um, feeding the defendant information in any way, that got put into this. And then the green is for mental competency. So anyone that really asked about, well, I don't think he's understanding the questions that are being asked, or I don't think he's all there in the head. Um, and then later on, when we get to the transcript confession, they'll talk about the lower IQ, things like that. Um, so you can see that the majority, 30.2% of comments really dealt with, well, he admitted it, so he's guilty kind of stuff. And then 14.9% dealt with investigators asked leading questions, and this is the false confession. And then 5.4% of comments asked about or had concerns about the mental competency. Here for the audio-only false confession, you can see that the green, the pink, and the, well, the pink and the purple kind of show up a little bit. Pink is for anybody that stated that the defendant was coerced into committing the crime. And then purple was for half admissions, like, oh, well, he was driving the car, so he's guilty of that, but he didn't shoot. Um, things like that, that got put into the purple category, but you can see very little people actually commented on that. Again, the orange kind of shrinks to 22.3%. Uh, false confession stays about the same with 14.9% for this one. Now for the transcript false confession, there are a lot of people concerned about mental competency. This is Brendan Daisy's confession. He has a low IQ, he's a juvenile, so a lot of people mentioned that, well, he doesn't understand the questions. That's what they really picked up on, is they thought he couldn't really understand what was going on, he was just answering yes or no, didn't really know what was being asked, um, and then they didn't know if he really could go to trial, or just could go to court because of his lower IQ, which it did go, and he's, he's currently in jail for that. Um, and then 
course confessions, a lot of people, about 14.4% of comments dealt with people saying he was coerced by the older accomplice. Uh, he told him to do her, and so he was coerced or manipulated or forced into committing the rape. And then about 18.8% uh, had comments dealing with, well, he confessed to the rape, so he must be guilty of the rape, but he never once talked about the murder, so I don't know if he's actually guilty of that, or maybe the older accomplice did it. So a lot of people mentioned that. And then you can see 5.4% had concerns about the investigators asking any questions and things <coughs> like that. And then 12.9% basically said, well, he admitted it, so he's guilty. Um, and so you can see that's lower than the other two confessions, and the transcript did do better with the not guilty verdicts here. So my final thoughts, uh, participants were worse than chance when giving correct verdicts for false confessions. Uh, this time around, they didn't even come close to getting to 50%. Uh, the transcript false confession did best. And then audio visual and audio only, which this was a little shocking for me because I had hypothesized that you know, audio only would do better. Uh, audio vision and audio only had comparable not guilty percentages. They were just like almost 1% away from each other, um, which, you know, we already know that audiovisual is inherently biased when it comes to showing people confessions, um, but it also kind of starts to make me think that maybe audio only might have those inherent biases that audiovisual has. Uh, male and female participants had comparable verdict scores, as you saw, both scoring higher on the verdict scale. So again, like, like political leanings and marital status, there were only three tests that were found statistically significant when it came to the gender of the participant. And there were instances where males rated higher and females rated higher, and it really didn't seem like there was too much of a difference between males and female participants when giving verdict decisions. Um, Audiovisual male defendants received higher verdict scores than female defendants, uh, and then audio only and transcript female defendants received higher verdict scores than male defendants. So overall, there appears to be differences in verdict scores when it comes to male defendants and female defendants, and it could be that the modality of recorded confession plays into that. So it could be if I you know, had more participants that could shrink, and there could be a clear like females rated higher for everything. But as of right now, it, it seems that audiovisual male defendants received higher verdict scores than females, and then for audio only and transcript, the female defendants rated higher than the males. So first and foremost, more research is necessary to give accurate and beneficial recommendations about the criminal justice system. However, based on the current study and previous studies analysis, it appears that using an audiovisual recorded confession may not be the best modality to show the jury. And from what I've seen, maybe potentially the transcript may be better. So I had a few limitations with my study. So last limitation was I didn't have enough. Well, this time I did have enough, but the diversity of my sample was an issue. Uh, majority were women. They were single, educated, white women. Um, so potentially could be generalizable to them, but if I had a more diverse population, not generalizable to them. Um, again, the study was posted and shared online. So it was posted, studied and posted, the study was posted and shared online. And so I can't validate who exactly took the survey, um, which I could have done if it was done in person. Uh, and then the quantity of the confessions. So last time it was the time, it just took way too long. Um, but now there's 12 confessions. And so I'd have comments, people would come up afterwards and they'd say things like, I was really excited to take it, it was really fun. But then by the transcript confessions, I was just like, oh my God, when is this gonna be over? Like there's so many confessions. And so that, that was a limitation because people were fatigued by then. Um, so of course, number one suggestion is gathering more participants and doing more research on this. And then number two is using less confessions. So an example that could be done is people clearly resonated with Brendan Daisy's confession. Uh, so maybe using his confession and just having that portion of it recorded in the different modalities and then um, having a group listen to each or watch each one and then trying to decipher if it's just that confession or maybe each modality affects that confession and the verdicts given. So that's the end. These are my references.